Emma Hurst was first elected in 2019, making her the second member of the Animal Justice Party to be elected to the New South Wales Legislative Council in Southeast Australia. Emma is a registered psychologist with a long history as an animal liberation advocate, and since being elected, Emma has established and chaired a parliamentary inquiry into the use of battery cages for hens in the egg production industry. Also, Emma will serve as deputy chair into an inquiry she established regarding the exhibition of cetaceans and of exotic animals in circuses. She opposes Australian ag gag laws. She's writing legislation to ban puppy farms and she advocates for tougher penalties for acts of animal cruelty, suggesting animals ought to be recognized as domestic violence victims in their own right. Thank you so much for being here today, Emma. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so I, it seems like you became vegan quite young, like you had that realization quite young and you were able to, uh, to live those values from a young age. Can you tell us about that journey a bit? Yes, so I, I trace my connection with animals back to when I was quite young. I recall sitting with a hen and I had this hen in my arms and I was patting this hen and she was purring. And I realised then that this hen shows joy in the same way as my cat at home shows joy. And I remember I was quite a young child. I remember going home and writing a letter to my parents and saying, you know, I don't want to eat animals anymore. Um, but it was actually quite a while later that um, somebody just handed me a flyer on the street and I went home and I went onto the internet and I read about the fact that dairy calves are taken from their mothers in the dairy industry. I read about the male chicks that are macerated at one day old in the egg industry. Um, and up until that point, I'd really been vegetarian and I hadn't really given it any further thought. Um, but when I read about what happens in these other industries, I went vegan overnight and it was really like a light switched on. And I realized not only that I need to change everything that I'm doing, but also that that this is something I need to dedicate my life to. I need to actually change what's happening within these systems. Cool. And were your parents supportive of your decision? Look, certainly when I went vegetarian, they were actually fairly good. I remember when I'd written that letter, my parents had said, that's fine, but you do realise you need to eat vegetables now. Um, so there was that sort of discussion with the parents. They were quite open-minded to me being vegetarian when I went vegan. Um, and, and mind you, this was sort of 21 years ago, or maybe a little bit longer. And most people, especially in Australia, hadn't even heard of veganism back then. Um, I mean, it was a real whole food plant-based diet. You know, we ate rice and, and pasta and legumes and fruit and vegetables. And, uh, you know, they'd never heard of this thing before. And so they were nervous at that stage. And, um, but I, I mean, I was a teenager by then, so I just sort of persevered and, and gave them all these educational materials. I remember um, um, finding all the materials from PCRM and sending them that to show them that, you know, I wasn't at any kind of risk of health issues and actually it was beneficial. And, and it was actually a good process because while they began questioning it, as I started to show them these materials saying, look, I'm actually going to be um, in better health, they started to change their own dietary behaviours and started to reduce how much um, animal products they were consuming because they were reading things on, on behalf of my health, um, but learning things for themselves. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, so you did some outreach, um, activism, and it's interesting. I've spoken for, with a few people who having that pamphlet placed into their hand is actually a similar story and and yet other people we can talk to them and talk to them and talk to them and they're just they just don't hear it but for some reason you know that's really encouraging I think for people who do that kind of activism to just keep doing it right and so yeah. do you want to talk about that activism and then how you made the switch to decide to go into politics yeah look I, and look I think it's really important to remember well, well, two things that, you know, whatever we do within activism, education has to be a key milestone as part of all of it. And so, you know, handing out those flyers, even if people aren't changing their behaviour, you're developing a, a base set of education and we need that before we can actually change people's behaviours. I When those, when that light went on, I was studying education at university um, and I switched to psychology because I realised that 
animal cruelty is a human caused problem and that the solution is, is human based as well. We need to change our behaviors. And so I studied health psychology, which really looks at, you know, how do we build mass behavior change? How do we get people to change their behaviors on mass? And health psychology looks at how to convince entire populations to quit smoking or wear seatbelts while driving. And I wanted to take some of those skills and ideas and research and actually apply it to how do you get people to change their diets and what they're eating away from animal products? How do they, we convince people to go to animal friendly entertainment where you don't have animals in circuses or animals in zoos, for example. So that's where I started. And I really started a lot of my advocacy in that individual behavior change area um, and corporate change as well. So convincing corporations to become more animal friendly um, but, and I, and I guess the biggest difficulty that we have as activists, especially if people have changed the same way I have, is this whole idea of if people know that they'll change. And we know obviously that there's things like cognitive dissonance where people don't want to accept what happens to animals and people will always resist change. Change is hard. The lights went on for me and I just knew, and, and the change was still hard, but I also knew I had to make it. But if you think about you know, anytime you've had a diet or a new exercise regime, or you've tried to change something in your life, how hard it is to stick to. And that's why we see a lot of people resisting any kind of change. And so it's overcoming those barriers and making it easier and more accessible and more normalized, which I think we're doing a really good job of. Um, here in Australia, we're the third fastest growing vegan market in the world. Um, and, and veganism is just booming. It's, it's absolutely massive. Every time I go to the supermarket, I get absolutely shocked that um, there's more vegan products. I actually just went um, to the supermarket a couple of days ago and found all these new products that I had absolutely no idea that even existed. Um, so it's becoming really, really big. And that's what actually led to my path in politics. I worked for about 10 years for uh, an organization called Animal Liberation. I'd worked for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I've worked for World Animal Protection International. And a lot of that work was around individual change, corporate change, media. And a, a former colleague of mine who had was the first elected representative of the Animal Justice Party um, actually came to me and he said, you know, would you consider running in the next election? And I really asked myself, where am I best placed to help animals? And I could see that, you know, there were so many activist groups and so much great work happening in corporate change and individual change. And yet our, our political system was so far behind. Um, we had got a ban on the greyhound racing because of all the cruelty that had been exposed and the government backflipped. Um, we still love export animals, um, thousands of kilometers over ocean despite multiple exposés of the cruelty that happens on these ships and also at the um, destinations that these animals arrive at. Um, you know, the, the entire, like, I mean, I'm not sort of pro free range farming by any means, but, you know, we still have the majority of hens in battery cages um, mm. in our country. We, you know, most of the eggs come from the battery cage egg industry still. And so it's just this real mindset in Australia and this lack of change in that political and legal space and that's why I thought no this is where this is the biggest hill but it's somewhere that has been neglected and so I realized that this is where this is where I needed to focus my time. Well and it's wonderful if you have public support for these changes. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about cognitive dissonance? You know, we, we say that word a lot. I think I understand what it is. But for people who maybe don't know what, that they're doing that, what, what is that? The cognitive dissonance is really something that comes into play when our behaviours don't actually match um, our own sort of internal beliefs. And so if we're doing something that doesn't match with who we think that we are, so most of the time when we're talking about it as far as animal advocacy, we're talking about people who say they love animals, who might have a rescue dog at home and they say, I love animals and they, they love, you know, Fido at home, but then you're exposed to them. What's happening to, for example, pigs in sow stores being forced to live in crates and they're going home to, to eat one of these animals. 
And it's a very difficult um, concept for them because in their mind, they love animals, they care about animals, and yet they're financially supporting a system that is actually very cruel to animals and causes animals a lot of pain and suffering. So the way for them to actually deal with that disconnect between their behaviours and their personal beliefs is to find excuses and to find ways out of that discussion and to ignore that, um, that conflict between their behaviours and their beliefs. And so that's when you'll hear people say, oh, it's okay, I only eat free range, or I very rarely eat animals, or oh, my doctor told me I had to, or I stopped for a while and I got really sick. Um, and so these are the excuses that we constantly hear, but that's actually the cognitive dissonance at play. That's the excuses to excuse why my behaviours don't actually match my beliefs. Is that a good explanation? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, you know, I was guilty of that for the first 30 years of my life. And because, you know, and it's really, who do we, we can't blame anybody for this, really. It's just become a part of the culture, I think, to, to normalize this violence. And so suddenly to, to, to shake that up and, and say, oh, no, I'm being violent by participating in this, is, it's a really harsh reality. I think the older we get to, it becomes more difficult. Yeah, and look, I think that um, it's really important to recognise when we do it ourselves in other spaces as well. Um, you know, one big one during the whole COVID lockdown is everyone had their keep cups. And then suddenly here in Australia, a lot of cafeterias were saying, no, we can't do the keep cups because of COVID. Um, so you're going to have to use one of these uh, disposable ones. And a lot of people said, oh, well, I can't go without my coffee, so I'll take the disposable ones. And, and you hear these sort of um, cognitive dissonance come into play and people say, oh, well, I'm vegan, so I'm already doing more for the environment than anyone else already. So <laughs> You know, it's it's the same thing. It's it's a it's at a smaller level, but we're all doing it in little places where we don't want to adjust our behaviour, or we don't want to realise, oh well, maybe I'll need to make my coffee at home now, and I can't go out and have that takeaway, or I'll need to bring some coffee into work. Um, so, you know, like there there are a few things that we all still do to a, to a smaller or lesser scale, but we we do do it ourselves um, in other spaces, and when we can recognise where we've done it ourselves, it makes it easier to have the conversation with the person that's going into a place of cognitive dissonance when we're talking about animal protection. Right. Yeah, I suppose it's easier to, to go into the cognitive dissonance and make those excuses if the rest of the culture is doing it anyway. So we're just, oh, well, everybody's doing it. So yeah, okay, good thing to keep an eye on. I'd like to also um, talk to Emma, the psychologist, about the domestic violence connection with animals. And do you think there is a, a, a direct link between the violence of eating animals and the normalization of that? And then just becoming, you know, has that helped evolve a violent culture? Look, I think that you know, violence is violence. And when we allow one form of violence in society, we can't overcome all the other forms of violence. Um, so what we're seeing in psychology is that there is a link between violence towards animals and domestic and family violence and child abuse and gun violence. Um, we even know from research where there are towns with slaughterhouses that there are higher crime rates. So we know that there's these links within violence. And what I truly believe is if we turn a blind eye to the violence that's happening to animals in slaughterhouses and um, in, in animal agribusiness, then you know, how, how do we overcome the violence in the domestic violence space or child abuse space when violence travels through these? And it, the only difference is that the victim is changing. And that's why we're seeing a link between all these different forms of violence. So we need to realise that violence is violence, that it's just the victim that changes. And we need to have a no tolerance stance to all forms of violence to be able to overcome all forms of violence. Right. OK, so now let's talk to Emma, the politician. And I'm really interested to know about politics in Australia. So. Do you have, because we have an animal protection party in Canada, and uh, we have a sort of similar parliamentary system, I think, uh, being part of the 
Commonwealth. Um, but I'm curious, do you have electoral reform? Like, do you have proportional representation? And did that help you get elected? So we have, um, so we have a Senate, and obviously, then we have electorates. And so um, we're running for the Senate, which is across the state. So we have one um, person in the upper house, which is the Senate in Victoria, and we have two here in New South Wales. So we represent the entire state that we're elected in, rather than um, a smaller electorate, um, it, it, which is called the lower house. And, um, and then we have a preferential voting system. So when you go in to vote, you might have another particular party that you like the most, um, and you give them a one. Now you can just give a one and then walk away, or you can actually put a number next to each different party. So you might actually put um, a two at, a, at another minor party um, and then vote everybody in a scale of say one to 10, depending on how many political parties are actually running in that election. Um, so what we find is that, you know, we get a pretty solid uh, first preference vote for people that want to see a voice for animals in parliament, but we also have an absolutely enormous second preference vote. Mm -hmm. And that comes, and the interesting thing with that second preference vote is it doesn't just come from, we've got a party here called the Greens who are a, sort of an environmentalist group. Most people would think that a lot of our second preferences come from them, um, but it's actually across the board. So we have two major parties. We have um, the Labor Party, which is quite pro-union. And then we have um, the Liberal Party, which is quite different to your Liberal Party. Our Liberal Party are actually the Conservatives, um, just to make things a bit confusing. Not that, not that much different. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the same. Yeah. Um, but those two parties, you know, a lot of second preferences from people who vote for those parties as well. Um, so, um, and that's what bumps our vote up. So once their vote exhausts, once they've um, run out and they don't have enough votes to get another seat, any, any that get left over then actually bump to us if we're a second preference. Interesting. So how long have, has, have you had that system and is that Australia wide or is that just in New South Wales? Um, look, it's, it's slightly different in each state. So in Queensland, we don't have an upper house at all. We only have the electorate system, um, which is not as strong because here in New South Wales, um, we have to have legislation passed in the lower house and in the upper house. And what makes it really interesting is that in New South Wales, um, the government is a, the Liberal National Coalition. So um, they hold the power. Now, in another state where if, if, if there was no other upper house, then they can just choose legislation and pass whatever kind of hideous stuff that they want, no matter who else is in power. And the only thing the other parties can do and the, electric, um, the uh, members can do is really go to the media. So people, and I, and I think this is slightly different in Canada, um, if you're elected to a party, you vote as a group. You know, you don't necessarily cross the floor or vote differently, which I, and I think in Canada, it's a little bit more de relaxed. It depends on the party. It seems that some parties demand that and so other parties don't. And then sometimes it seems like they'll allow a free vote for certain issues. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, we do have that, but it's, it's hard to get it. <laughs> so there's only a couple of issues where, where that's come up. Um, but with the upper house, you end up with a real mix because you won't usually get um, a specialised political party like a political party for animals to represent an entire electorate. We're more likely to get voted into the upper house. And so we end up with um, some of these more minor parties. So at the moment, we've got an independent, we've got three Greens, we've got two Animal Justice Party, um, we've got two from um, a very conservative party called One Nation. Um, we've got one from a party called the Christian Democratic Party, which is all about religion. Um, and then we've got another party, which is um, uh, not great for us, called the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. Oh. Um, but what that happened, what then happens is you've got the government and you've got the opposition, and then you've got this quite large crossbench and so when the legislation comes up into the upper house, um, you know, it really comes under a lot more scrutiny and we can all put up amendments and adjustments to every piece of legislation. And what we find is that actually 
ends up with much better piece of legislation. So there are some differences in the different states in Australia. Um, and the voting system is slightly different for federal than it is for state. Um, and, and it's complicated and it confuses people, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of people get their voting cards mixed up and confused um, because of the different systems. It's very frustrating, um, but um, I, I mean, it is somewhat similar um, by state to federal. Huh, interesting. Well, so your inauguration speech was really wonderful and it's on YouTube and I would invite people to go listen to it. And it was tremendously moving. And afterwards, you got what looked like a lot of support from uh, various folks. I'm wondering, that was in 2019. Um, you know, have have you been able to establish relationships with people from these various different parties and and work together and sort of negotiate on, on different things? Is, is that a beneficial way to do politics, do you think? Yeah, it's the only way that we can get anything done um, with a party of two. So we, whenever we want to put up an amendment, if we're doing a call for papers, if we're doing a notice of motion, or if we're even putting up our own piece of legislation, essentially we need either the government support, and they very rarely support us because of... So the government has the Liberal Party, and then they've also built a coalition with a very small minor party, um, who I think has less seats than the Greens even, um, but they collect a few farming seats. And so they're essentially figureheads for the animal agribusiness. And so they've formed a coalition with them and that makes it very, very difficult for us to get any kind of animal protection legislation through. So we end up quite often working with the Greens to get their three votes, um, Independent, who is um, a former Green as well, and then we, if we get labor over the line on, on animal issues, and it's very difficult to get them over the line on anything to do with introduced animals or farmed animals, but anything that's more broad, like, like for example, the penalty regime in New South Wales um, and increasing penalties for acts of animal cruelty. And that is across the board. That includes um, farmed animals as well. Mm. But we can get Labor support for certain things, then I need one more vote. And so to be able to get anything passed. And so I have to either go to the Christian Democrats or One Nation or the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers and try to get them over the line on, on something that we want. Um, and so that's how we've managed to get various things passed here in New South Wales, including, for example, um, you know, we recently banned people for life, mandatory bans for anybody that commits an act of serious animal cruelty or bestiality. So they can't work with animals, um, they can't have animals in their care, um, and that's a lifetime ban. There was actually a gap in our legislation that didn't even give the courts the provisions to be able to give these people bans. So somebody who'd been found guilty of bestiality, nobody had ever been banned from having further animals in their care, um, or working with animals. Um, so we flipped that not only, you know, it's not even a provision in courts, we've just made it automatic that if you're charged successfully under these charges, um, then that goes through automatically. So wow. we got the support on that one from um, both the Christian Democrats and One Nation. Um, but we didn't get the support of the shooters, fishers and farmers on that one. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Oh my gosh. Okay. And so currently, it sounds like your main focus are the puppy farms, the puppy mills. Is that one of yes. you? Yes. So for people who don't understand, why why should we be concerned about uh, puppy farms? And are you are we talking about um, you know the farmer down the road whose dogs just got pregnant and they've got some puppies and they're never gonna spay or neuter their dogs? Is that part of this as well? Um, so what we're doing, um, I'll, I'll go over some of the regulations uh, um, after I explain what the issue is, but essentially puppy farming is the intensive factory farming of dogs. Um, so in New South Wales, there's no limit on the number of dogs any one person can have, no caps on the number of litters that any female dog can be forced to endure. So we've got essentially factory farms of dogs for the pet trade industry. Um, Australians... Um, it's very common in Australia for people to have a companion animal at home. And, um, you know, we have a lot of dog parks. We're a real dog happy sort of uh, country. But 
um, with that comes a very big and lucrative industry to breed dogs. And we are finding places underground, hidden in places with 300, 400 female dogs living in absolute squalor um, and just re-impregnated over and over and over again. Um, you know, we've found dogs with, you know, absolutely riddled with disease. And the puppies that are being sold for $6,000 or more are also riddled with disease. Uh, my office gets called almost weekly with somebody else that has bought a dog online or bought a dog through a pet shop um, and taken this animal home and realized that it's going to cost him $12,000 in veterinary fees to try to save his or her life. Um, I mean, it's just at such an awful industry and yet it, it's almost entirely unregulated. Um, backyard breeding and puppy farming is virtually unregulated here in New South Wales. And what we're seeing at the moment, this has become a real urgent issue because um, our neighboring state, Victoria, recently brought in all these regulations that essentially ban puppy farming. And so all these notorious breeders are simply moving across the border into New South Wales, where our laws do virtually nothing to protect companion animals. Um, so our legislation um, will actually look to regulate the entire industry. So we've been talking with experts about um, the maximum number of litters that a female can have, which would be two, um, the maximum number of dogs that somebody can care for in one, in one place. Um, so to make sure that we're not farming dogs, um, but also bringing in a whole lot of regulations so that, you know, if, a, if, if somebody is going to allow a female dog to become pregnant, um, to make sure that there's a vet that visits her and sees her before she's pregnant, and, and after she gives birth to those litters as well. Um, so essentially it will get rid of that intensive factory farming of dogs, um, but it will ensure that all these sort of backyard breeders and, and that sort of, you know, that, those dodgy industries where they're pushing animals out um, stop. And we also want to um, obviously stop um, animals and, and breeders from being able to sell animals through pet shops. Um, obviously there's the issue with impulse buying, but it's also, um, you know, a real smoke mirror to hide puppy farms and to hide the conditions that the dogs are being bred in. Um, so we need to make sure that pet shops are really only adoption centres for rescue organisations. And as the Animal Justice Party, obviously, our position is always adopt, don't shop. Um, and, you know, there's so many loving animals in rescue centres and pounds. And, you know, if somebody does have the ability to take in an animal in their home to go and look to save a life. Are there inspectors uh, in Australia? Are people hired to, as, you know, um, dog cops? I guess who can who are investigating this is is the problem that there, that you don't know. Well, it sounds like you know about it, but there's just no laws to do anything about it. So there's very few laws to do anything. Um, but then we've also got a problem. We've got so. Um, the animal cruelty legislation here in Australia is the only piece of criminal legislation that isn't fully funded by the government to actually enforce those laws. Um, they actually give one charity or two charities about 6% of the cost it would be to enforce the laws as to how much they're doing now, which means that these charities then have to fundraise from the public to be able to uphold the law by investigating um, animal cruelty complaints and actually prosecuting, which means that it's very hard to get a prosecution for animal cruelty. Um, and it's very hard to also get these agencies to actually investigate in many situations as well, because they are so poorly funded um, and it's, it's so expensive to go through the court system and they need to make sure that they're going to win as many cases as they possibly can. And so this all weighs into their decisions about going to court, how much evidence that they have. So it's a really difficult um, system that's been set up. I mean, essentially, animal protection laws in Australia have been set up to fail. Um, as I said, you know, we've got this um, coalition with the National Party who are figureheads of animal agribusiness industry. So we've got you know, legislation that has exemptions to cruelty laws for farmed animals and introduced animals. Um, we've got 
um, the Minister for Agriculture has the portfolio for animal welfare. So, you know, he's got this massive conflict of interest. His, his main purpose is to protect primary industries, um, which is often in conflict with animal protection. And then we've got, the, of the very weak laws that we do have, we've got a private charity trying to uphold those laws. Um, while having to fundraise from the public to be able to do so. Um, you know, one of the um, analogies I make is imagine the police force having to organise a fun run to raise money to investigate drug labs. Um, I mean, it's, it's really that absurd. There is no other piece of legislation where we have to fundraise from the public to be able to uphold the law. Um, and so what, what the solution is, is actually quite simple. We need an independent office of animal protection that is fully funded by government to enforce the legislation that we have. And that independent officer of animal protection needs to be separated from agriculture. So it needs to fall under another minister, minister for police or minister for environment, somebody that doesn't have that conflict of interest. Um, and then we'll start to see some major improvements in animal protection laws. Um, and so that's why we're fighting for that. But it's a real systemic change that's needed um, to be able to see um, you know, proper enforcement and proper oversight um, of, of the weak laws that are in place, but also improvement of those laws so that we don't have things like puppy farmings being able to continue to run legally in the state. Right. Yeah, well, that sounds like good job creation. You know, yes. <laughs> I'm sure there'd be lots of people who'd be love to have jobs um, in in that department. And so it sounds like in Australia, just like in Canada and the U.S., there are subsidies going from our ta tax dollars. And, you know, even as vegans, we pay taxes and then we really don't have much say as to where those taxes go. And so similarly, it sounds like a lot of that is going to, or a, a percentage of that is going to animal agribusiness. And yeah. you're working uh, with a transformation uh, process. Uh, is that some, how, you know, what's going on with that? Yeah, so it's, and, and it's interesting, you know, we were talking a little bit before about, you know, those different pillars of change. And so there's that individual change and the corporate change. And the reason why political change needs to be part of that, if we're going to get, you know, the fastest change possible um, and the biggest change is possible is because it doesn't matter at the moment how many people change their behaviours and move away from buying these products. You know, I made a conscious decision. I don't want to... Um, financially support the dairy industry anymore because of animal animal cruelty issues because of environmental issues and so I switched my purchasing behavior but of course my taxes are then being used to prop up this industry um, without my say in it and in fact we had um, an inquiry I was the deputy chair on, on an inquiry where the dairy industry was asking for more subsidies so they were asking for more money from the government um, and trying to find creative new ways to get more government support and more public money, people's taxes to actually prop up their industry because more and more people are moving away from it, wow. away from that industry. So they were saying, can you, well, they're, they're asking for things like labeling laws changes, um, make sure these plant-based milks can't call themselves milks um, so that it develops confusion amongst consumers and so they don't make that direct switch. And they're also asking for um, milk to be provided to school kids again for free. Um, and so obviously the government and our taxes would pay for that. Um, and so um, I actually brought into that inquiry, I actually ended up getting this wonderful woman, her name's Jackie Norman. She was a dairy farmer in New Zealand. She's now um, a very strong vegan advocate. She even has vegan cookbooks out there. And she came and presented evidence at the inquiry about the animal cruelty in the industry, um, about you know, the fact that so many farmers are experiencing depression and hardship and, and gave her own raw personal experiences as to why people would be feeling this way um, and how hard it is in Australia and New Zealand to you know, run a dairy farm with major environmental crises going on and being part of that environmental crisis um, and contributing even more to it. Um, so she was fantastic. And we spoke with her and a couple of vegan organizations, Vegan New South Wales and Vegan Australia about transformation. How do we 
actually use those subsidies instead of trying to prop up a dying industry why don't we use that money that's already been set aside to actually help farmers transition out of dairy and into more sustainable plant-based farming where the consumer demand is if that consumer demand is growing and in australia most of our plant-based proteins are being imported from countries overseas despite the fact that we're such a quickly growing um, vegan market and that plant-based proteins are dramatically increasing in in popularity so you know we're missing out on this huge opportunity and it doesn't mean that we you know need to you know close down that industry and leave people there it's really about actually providing a support system to re-educate and change the farming systems that those people are doing away from animal agribusiness and towards plant-based and sustainable agriculture um, so so that that system still exists and people still have jobs um, because obviously people will still need to eat plants no matter no matter where our system changes to there will need to be a form of farming system um, but we just want to move that towards plant-based agriculture, which is environmentally friendly and obviously um, avoids a huge amount of the animal cruelty that, that exists in the animal agribusiness industry. Well, that's one thing I will say our federal liberals um, did do. Um, shortly after uh, the COVID lockdown, actually, I heard about a significant investment in plant-based um, proteins in the prairies here. So, you know, yeah, they occasionally they, they do the right thing. And there is one vegan um, elected as a liberal in-, in Nathaniel? Yeah, Nathaniel, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so, I spoke to him. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, he sounds like, apparently he's a really great guy and, uh, and the Liberal Party federally is, you know, it sort of has a, it's Canadiana, right? Uh, the Trudeau empire. <laughs> and it sort of has this nice warm feeling for the elder folks who vote. Um, but we do have to keep an eye on what they're actually doing because it's not always all that friendly, especially the foreign policy. But so there's poor old Nathaniel, this one vegan in this party that he was able to get elected with, so good for him. Um, I'm wondering in Australia, back to politics just for a moment, are, are there any other vegans in any of these other parties that you can work with? This, this is a very strange one. Well, I don't know if I can work with him, but we do have a vegan in the party that I mentioned before called the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. What? Yeah, so in the lower house, one of the um, one of the shooters is is a vegan. Um, well, he calls himself 100% plant based, which is probably more yeah. accurate. Yeah. So he um, he's 100% plant based for health reasons. So, I'm, but I mean, I, I think that that goes to show like how much this is growing um, right. as well. Um, and obviously, there's two of us in the Animal Justice Party, and then we've got our own staff and team. Um, so, and there are a couple of, well, there's one vegetarian and a vegan staff member in the Greens. Um, so we're pushing them quite a bit because as an environment party, right. um, yeah. I think that they need to really start to recognise yeah. that, you know, veganism is um, the only. Yeah. <laughs> the, green, the Green Party so. internationally is kind of, it's time for them to step up for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, oh, I just had something in my head. Um, oh, right. Okay. So in Canada, we have the Animal Protection Party. Have you had any correspondence with them or other other animal parties internationally? So we've had quite a bit to do with the Dutch Party for Animals. I think they're the, they're the first party for animal protection in the world. Um, and so they got elected and they also have an international body as well, which I think connects all the different groups. So there's one in the UK, there's one in Ireland, um, and there's one where you guys are in Canada. So, um, I mean, that's supposed to kind of connect us, but I think that we probably need more of a connection. Um, uh, yeah, like, I mean, it's very easy to sort of get lost into your own country, but obviously animal protection needs to be worldwide. Um, I have had a little bit to do with Canada when we were working with the ban on cetaceans for entertainment. Um, I spoke with um, Wilfred Moore, who I think is, is a retired um, Liberal MP. He actually put up the legislation in Canada to originally to um, ban the use of cetaceans in entertainment. 
Um, and, and we've been able to be successful here in, in New South Wales as well to get the same sort of, a very similar sort of provisions through. Um, so we started by working in Canada because we'd heard that Canada just got a ban. And of course, that's really helpful international because when we did the inquiry on it, you know, we had people say, oh, and Canada's just banned. <laughs> and so, you know, it's really good to be able to use the momentum from what's happening in other countries. Um, and it was really good to be able to get the same here in New South Wales. We've got one state left which hasn't banned, you know, the breeding and continued use of, um, it's, it's most, it's actually only dolphins that they're using. We don't have whales or anything being used, but um, we have SeaWorld on the Gold Coast, which is in Queensland. Um, so we, we've got some pretty strong campaigns and a lot of animal groups as well, getting on with those campaigns um, and putting that pressure onto the Queensland government um, as, as the last state in Australia that's really letting the entire country down um, on protecting cetaceans. Right, yeah. Well, and it's interesting that we've been speaking about the domesticated imported animals, um, uh, food animals, and um, what about the wild uh, life? What about the wild life that is indigenous to Australia that you know, the ranchers, as is happening around the world, the, the ranching of animals and the, and the factory farming of animals takes land away from, from the wild species. I'm assuming that's happening in Australia. We all, of course, were devastated by the fire situation uh, a couple of years ago. We're having a terrible start to our fire season here in British Columbia. Um, you know, what, what should we know about the impact of uh, our choices and this this normalization of violence towards these domesticated animals. And what should we think about when in regard to people who are concerned about wilderness and wildlife? Yeah, we've got really big problems here in, in Australia in regards to um, our treatment of our native animals. Um, the koala is facing extinction in the next 30 years. Um, and, you know, that's only been made worse by the bushfires um, and, and obviously all those environmental, um, you know, we're a country, we're such a dry country, we, we often end up with, in drought and there's going to be more extreme bushfires in this country. Um, what happened seemed unusual at the time, but the reality is it's going to keep on happening while the climate disaster continues to unfold. Um, Australia is going to be, you know, at the forefront of a lot of that, of what happens. Um, and the issue with our koalas has just recently become worse um, because um, the deputy leader in New South Wales, we had um, some koala protection policies and the leader of the National Party actually wanted to amend it so that animal agribusiness were exempt from those koala protection policies. Um, the majority of koalas are actually on private land, um, but our government's also very pro-logging industry as well. And so... Um, it means that animal agribusiness can basically log on their land or cut down trees, even if there's koalas on it, um, despite the fact that most koalas are on private land. So, we, you know, the protection of koalas is virtually nil. Um, it's, it's not going to be enough to actually save them as a species. And then we've also got the kangaroo industry. So we've got a commercial industry. It's the largest commercial slaughter of native wildlife in the world. Um, people actually go out and shoot kangaroos. Um, and what we're asking the world to do is to be aware of what's happening to kangaroos in our country and to make sure not to buy kangaroo meat, not to um, buy kangaroo leather, which is often used on, on different uh, soccer shoes and soccer balls, for example. Oh. So, um, and, and it, it was interesting when I spoke with um, Nathaniel, he was talking about seal clubbing in Canada um, and his vote against seal clubbing. And I said to him, do you realize that we do the same thing here to joeys? So in our legislation, it actually says, if you shoot a mother, that you are to kill her joey with blunt force trauma, which what? basically means, it means clubbing the joey to death. And that's what's actually in the code of practice wow. as, as to the best practice of how to treat these joeys. And it's absolutely hideous. We've got wildlife carers that go out in the morning and find you know, the heads of kangaroos that have been killed. They find the dead bodies of these joeys that have been clubbed to death. Um, that's what this industry is. 
Um, and that's what we need the world to recognize. And we need pressure externally. What was interesting when I spoke to Nathaniel, when I started to look at the speeches in parliament um, that were supportive of seal clubbing, I mean, you could literally take out the word seal and put the word kangaroo. And that's the speeches that are politicians are giving in Australia about the, the kangaroo killing industry. And there's a real blind spot amongst Australians. Australians will be very quick to say we're against seal clubbing. We think that that's horrific. But you ask them what they feel about the clubbing of joeys and they've probably never heard it. So there's a real head in the sand issue. Um, and we need that international pressure because um, a lot of people within Australia themselves aren't listening. We did get an inquiry up on kangaroos um, and particularly the commercial industry um, and, and the rate of number of animals that they're killing. We're very nervous that, you know, they're weakening the species strain. Obviously, they're killing the largest males and actually changing that nat natural selection, even within their breeding, um, which will have major long-term consequences as well. So there's a lot of stuff that got pulled out in that inquiry. It's about actually making the government take action and to actually um, look at the evidence that came out of that inquiry and to make changes. Um, but the thing that they will respond to most is probably that international pressure. It's interesting. I just spoke with uh, Stephen Best from the Animal Protection Party, and he he was involved in the, uh, there was a vote in the European Union uh, back in the 80s, I think, late 70s. Um, he and a, a small team, they traveled around Europe and talked to them about banning the import of seals. Right. And that's how then eventually they were able to get legislation here because it was a similar thing. People didn't know about it or it's a, it becomes a jobs issue for, you know, that people are employed doing that. And I don't think they were considered pests. I am imagining kangaroos are maybe considered pests to the farmers, are they? That's what they call them, yeah. yeah. Um, and essentially it becomes, you know, like you can't really sort of have a native animal that, you know, is essentially what's happening as, as we're sort of growing out and, and building more and more houses, you're sort of pushing kangaroos further and further out. And, of course, they're desperate for food and water, and so they often end on these up on these same properties as where cows and other animals are being kept. Um, and then they see them as competition for the grass. Um, and so that's why they're calling them pests, but they're certainly not anywhere in plague proportions um, or, or in really large numbers. They're just being pushed further and further out. Well, I mean, then these are unique animals. You have animals that exist nowhere else on earth, right? And so um, we're almost out of time, but I'm wondering about uh, sharks as well. People, sharks get a really bad reputation and the, and the fishes, um, is, is that uh, another part? You have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of work to do in Australia. And look, that's part of why we've been elected, I think, because I think Australians are really sick of the political system failing animals. Um, and shark nets is, is, is another prime example of that. Um, so we have shark nets on a lot of our beaches and all the research suggests that they create a false sense of security. Um, they aren't actually stopping shark bites from, from occurring. So it's just to give swimmers and people this, this sense of, of, of we're safe to actually swim here. Um, now, of course, the sharks get caught in these, in these nets and die, um, but huge numbers of other animals get caught in those nets and die as well. Um, you know, stingrays, turtles, um, starfish, other types of fish, you know, a lot of threatened animals as well. Um, so they're hugely problematic and hugely cruel. You know, the animal gets caught in the net um, and can't move and will either strangle or will drown if they need to, to come up for air. Um, so it's just, you know, a, a really awful contraption. And because it's sort of hidden, again, it's one of those things that's out of sight, out of mind. Um, and, and it's entirely unnecessary. Um, but we have been working with groups like um, Humane Society International. The Animal Justice Party also has um, regional groups set up all around um, New South Wales um, and in Victoria as well. And so where we've got regional groups in areas around the beaches where there are shark nets, They've been campaigning to councils to get councils on board. And we've got quite a few councils now writing to the state government to say, we don't want 
nets on our beaches anymore because of the cruelty of the animals and the fact that we know from the research that they're entirely ineffective. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's something else that we will see change here in New South Wales. There's definitely um, a lot of public support for the end of the use of shark nets. And there are other um, much more um, effective methods that we can actually use to deter sharks. Um, people can wear personal deterrents if they're going out surfing, for example. Um, we could actually subsidise that through government if people wanted to get some of those shark deterrents. Um, increases in lifeguards. Um, you know, there's a whole range of different uh, methods that can be used to actually um, stop the attacks of sharks, which, which are very rare. You're more likely to get hit by a bus than, than get um, attacked by a shark, let's be realistic. Um, but, you know, we can put measures in place to make our beaches safe, um, much, which will be much more effective than, than netting. Right. And sharks are actually a really important part of the ecosystem of the ocean, and people need to educate themselves about that for sure. Well, there's a lot going on, and so I'm so thankful that you, your Australian people voted for you so you can do some of this and um, set some groundwork and, and then elect more people the next time around. For, for young people, we're having an election probably in Canada soon as well. Um, for people who are, you know, ethical vegans and want to make change, what, do you have any advice as we leave uh, for them? Uh, you know, what is it? Is it worth going into politics is it just a nightmare is it you know how, how has it changed your life what what's going on there look I, I definitely think it's a really positive avenue to be able to get change you know we've had some really significant wins we've you know we've got eightfold increases in penalties for animal cruelty which you know really raises the status of animal cruelty in, in new south wales we've got mandatory bans for for people who have abused animals we've introduced a whole suite of legislation that recognizes animals as victims of domestic violence um, we've got money towards refuges to build shelters for animals that are escaping violence um, we've been able to ban the use of cetaceans for entertainment you know like and, and this is i'm you know i was only elected two two and a half years ago wow. um, you know so we've got some things through and we're still sort of pushing and obviously it, it's it's a much harder thing in, a, in in australia at the moment because of the power of the lobby groups within the animal agribusiness industry but we need somebody in there advocating for the animals. The reason why the agribusiness has got away with so much is because there hasn't been a voice for animals in politics. Whereas now that we're there to fight them every step of the way, um, you know, that dairy inquiry we, we talked about, one of the recommendations was that the government consider providing money to farmers to transition out of the industry. Um, and that's the evidence that we made sure became part of that inquiry and of course led to that recommendation. And that's the first transformation recommendation that has ever happened in Australia. So we need to be there to actually start to build some of these roadworks um, on, on issues that are hard to, to get towards. Um, and we need to sort of start to actually close the gaps in some of that, you know, I don't want to say easier legislation because it's still a really big fight to get some of these things through on companion animals and other issues as well. But, you know, where we can get some of those wins and some of those big changes, then, then you know, you need to be in there to be able to make those changes. So, you know, definitely run. Um, you will need to, you know, speak with people that, you know, aren't vegans that aren't similarly minded and actually bring them over to to your way of thinking you need to be happy to go and knock on everybody's door and keep talking about these issues um, but you know if you've got that ability then then do it give it a go um, because the animals desperately need voices through that political process all around the world did you were you elected the first time you ran or I ran federally first. Um, it's very difficult to get elected federally here in Australia. Um, we're still building and growing our party. So I ran federally um, in a lower house seat. Um, and then I ran, the first time that I ran in state, I got in. Um, and it was the second time New South Wales had run a state election with the Animal Justice Party. So the first time we ran in New South Wales, we got someone elected. And the second time we ran, we got someone elected as well. And, and that was me in my seat so yeah we're, we're quickly growing compared to other parties 
That's great. And I guess it's if people don't want to run themselves, there's always lots of work that they can do to support whoever is running. <laughs> yeah, we need lots of volunteers. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emma. It's been really lovely chatting with you. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing for the animals and for all of us. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for bringing me on. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, that was great. And thank you. And um, uh, I'll send you the links as they happen. I know you're busy, so I'll let you get on with your day. <laughs> Stay safe and all of that. And um, yeah. Thank all right. You too. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you. You too. Yeah. Take care.